You've heard of the butterfly effect. A butterfly flaps its wings on the other side of the world. By the time it gets to us, it's a hurricane. It's the idea that little things can have big consequences. Now, this is especially true about the choices we make when we're young. You see, every decision ripples out into our world and our future in ways that we can't possibly imagine. And we carry them to the end of our days. The choices we're making right now can affect our long-term health, our ability to get a job, our future spouse, our kids, our grandkids, everything. What you do will always be with you. But there is one choice that towers over all the rest. Get it right, and every bad decision you've ever made can be wiped away. Get it wrong, and a lifetime of good choices will one day turn to dust. When you choose to follow the Creator, when you choose to surrender your ways to Him, when you decide to trust Him with your life, you will have figured out the one choice that really matters. You see, the beat of a butterfly's wing may or may not change the world, but the choice to follow Christ will change you and countless others forever. Amen, amen. Happy New Year. Great to see you today. Go ahead and grab your Bible and uh, turn to the book of Acts. That's where we're going to be. You can see there, we, uh, TJ noted, we are into a new series, kicking off a new year, a new decade. How about that? Anybody ready for the Roaring Twenties? Let's do this. Uh, we're going to hear the roar of our King, Ju uh, the Lion of Judah. He's going to be roaring among us. How many of you are here Christmas Eve? Anybody here Christmas Eve? Okay. Um, hope you had a great Christmas. We had some 4,000 plus some odd people all day long over here. Um, anybody here last week? They may hear Demos Celebrarius, my man. Yes. Incredible uh, story of, of incredible life change and how God has taken, we talked about it Christmas Eve. Um, Takes, takes our mess and turns it into a masterpiece. He takes our scribbles and he turns it into stories of his grace. But if you're, you know, some of us I know are approaching the new year and everybody's making resolutions and goals and all that good stuff. And I got goals and resolutions. But I think some of us, we grow kind of skeptical if we're real honest and we're like, I don't know, I've tried before. Like I went to the gym three weeks last year in January and I've tried. And, I can't, and sometimes I think we can just spill over into our spiritual lives and we think, well, I don't really know that God can do much with me. I mean, I kind of am who I am. It's the way it's going to go. He might tweak a few things. But, but what I want to talk about today is how God desires to do a radical change and shift in your life. And the first step is to be open to that and to be ready and say, Lord, I believe that you can do this. I mean, to say that you can't change says more about what you believe about God than what it says what you believe about yourself. And, and so God can do a work. And we're going to look over the, the next month, we're going to look at the life of Saul. Okay, I'm going to, we know him as Paul. I'm going to use that interchangeably, mostly Saul today. I'll talk about why his name was changed or why we know him as Paul. But we're going to use him as kind of a character study throughout this, um, this, this, this month as we look into this brand new year. And I want to welcome everybody. I know lots are, are watching outside uh, the walls here, either online or out in, in our overflow area. We're so glad that you're here. Don't miss a week. I just paused to say this. Grateful that you're here today. Don't miss a week. The practice of coming together weekly for worship will change your life. Just as being in, in the presence of God's word and his spirit daily will change your life. Uh, I'm thinking a lot about renewal more than I am about resolutions this year. I'm going to talk a lot about that in the coming days, just personal spiritual renewal. I want to be an agent of renewal in my relationships, my family, my marriage, in my church, uh, and I want you to join me. We're going to talk a lot about that, and that demands then the presence of God in my life. That's the difference maker, right? Is if I am, am before him and his spirit is filling me, then I become an agent of renewal all to his glory and to his, his fame. And so Let's talk about it. Let's look at the life of Paul. Now, we're going to draw from the theme, really, driving verse um, throughout this whole month is uh, from his own words. Okay, 2 Corinthians, you probably know this, 5.17, he says, you know, that Christ has come. He's rescued us from our sin. So you'll see it here. Let's say this together. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. 
Behold, the new has come. We finished the year of the Bible, reading through Scripture, uh, just not too many days ago. And it was Jesus saying in Revelation 21, Behold, I'm making all things new. This is where all of history is heading. It's the driving purpose and end of all creation. But he's doing it now. He's making all things new. So this month we're going to see how, he, how this new thing happens. He gives us a new start. We'll talk about that today. He gives us a new identity. He gives us a new family and he gives us a new purpose. Do you ever wonder though, when you hear about stories, and if you know much about the story of Saul, Paul, pretty radical story as we'll see today. Uh, last, if you heard Demos last, pretty radical story. Some of you know some real crazy stories of, of transformation. Some of us sit back and go, yeah, but you know, uh, can, can I really get you know, a do-over? Can I really start again? And I'm here to tell you this morning that you can. If, if, if God can take Saul, the, the, the most terrorizing anti-Christian terrorist, literally, um, and he turns him into the greatest missionary ever known, uh, he can take your life and mine, and he wants to do that today, regardless of where you are on the spiritual spectrum or how long you've been a follower of Jesus. So I want you to turn to Acts chapter 9, and while you're turning there, uh, I'll just state what I think is obvious. If you don't know much about Saul, Paul, no one beyond Jesus has impacted the, the church, advanced the gospel more than, than Paul. Think about it. All the great theologians, this is true in my life and yours, if you're a Christian and you've been in the Word much, no one has impacted my theology more than Paul. Um, you think of Augustine, you think of Luther, you think of Calvin, Wesley, go on and on. All of them owe their understanding of the gospel to Saul, to Paul. This past summer, we looked at Romans, the book of Romans, and how it just unpacks the, um, you know, the, whole, the whole gospel uh, as, we, as we come to understand what the gospel really is, and, and we owe it all to him. Uh, so, so how did this happen, and how is it that he ends up writing 13 books of the New Testament? Um, it is a radical and amazing story that we'll seek to apply. I'm going to give you some history to set it in context, and then we'll draw from some points that we can apply. But you're probably like me. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 1, um, and Paul says, hey, follow me as I follow Jesus. I have desired that to be true. My first Sunday I ever preached here almost 10 years ago. My decade was spent uh, here as, as pastor. And I, um, that was my, my hope and my challenge, that you can follow me as I seek to follow Jesus. And I hope that is true of your life, that you would want that to be the case for you. His conversion is one of the greatest moments in all of history. And we're going to look at this moment. We know more about him uh, already than we're going to see here. And, and in fact, we meet him in uh, the stoning of Stephen. You might know it, Acts 7. He's there as an accomplice. And uh, he's from Saul, uh, I mean Saul of Tarsus, a city about 12 miles off the northeast, if you know that region, uh, of the Mediterranean. So there's, there's Antioch, and then beyond that is Damascus, where he's going to find himself today. Uh, in, in Acts chapter 9, verse 1 and 2, it gives us a geographical and chronological setting. So hang with me here. Watch this. But Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at, at Damascus, so that he so that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Okay, so he's seeking out some documents, I guess some affirmation, some permission to go into synagogues and pull people out. Now, Acts 9 picks up where Acts 8, verse 3 left off, which says this, but Saul was ravaging, now he's in Jerusalem, the church, and entering house after house, he dragged off men and women, committed them to prison. He's ravaging. This means, I mean, wreaking havoc. It's, it's with an intent to injure or kill someone, is what this means. He's literally an anti-Christian terrorist going from house to house. He's not the executioner, but he's an arresting officer who goes in, pulls them out, and then sends them on to prison. And then it also, he tells us later in Acts 26, that any time there was a vote on whether or not to... To kill a Christian, I mean, in regard to capital punishment because of their beliefs, he said he always voted yes. Kill them. He hated the Christians, and he was out to do away with this new movement. So now what happened in Jerusalem because of his work? Christian refugees were heading out of Jerusalem to Damascus, pretty good ways north. And this is why Saul is here. 
It says there that he's coming after people of the way, which was, you might know, the designation of early believers in the church. I love that. That's a cool word, name, by the way. I like that. Um, now, Christians is pretty awesome. It means little Christ. We're called that in Antioch later on, chapter 13 or so. Um, but uh, how about people of the way? That'd be pretty legit, don't you think? Because Christians kind of been hijacked, right? Now, I'm not suggesting we go away from that, but kind of been hijacked from people who aren't little Christs, who don't follow the way of Jesus. We're going to be talking a lot this year about the way of Jesus. And so people of the way, he's coming after them. And in verse 3, it says, Now, as he went on his way, he approached Damascus, which is uh, a city there in Turkey. It's a, no, it's in Syria, a mess of a city. The least livable city on the planet, by the way, by research and, and how they measure those things. There's a Syrian civil war been going on for a long time. But here it was a place of refuge. And suddenly, a light from heaven shone around him. Now, Paul himself describes this later on in Acts 22 and Acts 26. And he says that this, this light, uh, it outshined the sun. This took place at midday. And he sees this light brighter than the sun. No wonder, if you know where this story goes, no wonder he ends up blind. I mean, this is a bright light. And, and he says this, verse 4, And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Now notice this. Jesus so identifies with his followers. He so identifies with us when we are persecuted, when we are oppressed, and we're not getting taken out of our homes, yanked out of our homes, tossed into prison. So let's don't pretend like we're being, you know, oppressed. You might be being made fun of at work, or people don't include you, or think you're crazy because you're a Christian. And so we're like, well, yeah, I can't talk about that. As if that's persecution. Here is real persecution taking place, and Jesus says, when they come after you, they're coming after me. Friends, we should take great confidence in that. When we are persecuted or oppressed or put down, they're coming after Jesus. But notice the question. It's worth pondering for a moment. Why? Why are you persecuting me? He so identifies, he says, you're persecuting me. But he asked the question. This is worth thinking about. Why have believer, true believers been persecuted throughout all of church history? Why is that? And why is it that we see this growing kind of challenge in our day? Why would anyone persecute a believer who supposedly we stand for love and grace and, and the answer to you know, salvation and all that is life and joy? Why? Because, and, and, and Paul is the example here, I think, because any time you come with the message of grace, okay, first it challenges your faith. You're challenged to believe something you cannot see or put, put a grip on. And it also challenges your own self-salvation project. That's the great threat. It takes you out of control. And anyone that is a religious person, right? That's what religion is. I must do these certain things and I can measure these things. I'm doing these things in order to gain uh, approval before God. Christianity strips that away. Christ confronts us and says the only thing you bring to the table is your sin that makes your salvation necessary. I do the rest. It takes me out of the control, out of the driver's seat. Yes, I can't do anything. Now, a lot of us see that as good news. But if you are a religious zealot, it's why they're the most dangerous. And why often, yes, Christians can be if we're pursuing some legalistic set of rules instead of being guided by a loving person. Those are two very different things. I'd argue the former is not even a true believer. Because Christ sets us free from that. But look at this. We're persecuted because their, their, their faith, if you will, what they believe in is threatened. It's going to take them out of control. So this is worth noting. The validity of any religion is found in how it responds to those who do not agree. And this is so important in this cultural moment we find ourselves in. See, see being so tolerance doesn't mean you don't have beliefs. Tolerance means... Uh, that, you, that those who disagree with you, it means that you, you, you respond with love and not with some kind of a radical need to lash out, even on social media, okay? And certainly not in person. We, we don't do it any time because we don't need to. And if you are intolerant, watch this, of intolerant people, you have become what you're blaming them or, or, or claiming, accusing them of being. 
So we, we don't have any need to lash out at someone who disagrees with us. Our faith is not that fragile because it's based on what Christ has already accomplished. And, and yet what we're seeing in our day that is really troubling for me is, you know, another word that's been hijacked, evangelicals, a good word, euangelion, those who believe the gospel, that's a great word, but been hijacked by people who aren't necessarily following Jesus. And so we see in our day this fragility among evangelicals that we're, 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 we're losing ground and we, we respond with anger, we respond with this supreme kind of privileged kind of position because we've had a kind of privileged position in our culture, and we're losing it. But we don't have to be afraid. I'm seeing this among white evangelicals in particular. I talk about this often. I see it among male white evangelicals. And it's because we have this privileged position for so long, now we're, thinking, we're feeling like we're going to lose it, which just reveals a fragile faith in something that does do this. Instead, our faith is in Christ and our confidence is in the Holy Spirit to change lives. He's the one who does this, not us. So we can stand with great confidence in how we enter into conversation with people. First, love them because we know that every act of love, listen, every act of kindness whispers the name of Jesus to people who do not yet believe. And we can, we're not going to fear and I'm guessing that in the 20s, we're going to continue to see this, this division in our culture between those who are truly following after Jesus and those who are not. It's going to get crazy, friends. I'm telling you. But we are not afraid. Because our faith is in the one who changes lives. And if it means that we must go darker and darker in order for true light to shine, then I say, bring it on. Let's go. I believe that the next generation where my kids are growing up into is going to be a time where there is a weeding out of the cultural Christian. And those who truly believe are going to have to stand strong and stand firm. And we're going to be those who say, I, I am not going to move. I'll enter into conversation and I will listen with love. That's what I'll do first. Because I am not shaken by those who disagree with me. Because the power of the gospel changes lives. And friends, we've got to lean into that and live that way. But let's talk about how this works. And I'll just close out with some points. If you take notes on sermons, this is a good place to start here. And he said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Okay, we've already looked at that. A new start requires personal, a personal encounter with Jesus. A new start requires a personal encounter with Jesus. Notice this is an objective confrontation with Jesus. This is not a vision. The others see it. This is not a vision. This is Jesus. And Paul says later, I saw him face to face. Now, I guess you could argue, was it a vision? Was it real? Was it... Now, we know that God still speaks through visions. Some of you know my friend Abraham Sarkar, a member of our church. I've been to India where I've heard story after story of people who've had visions, dreams that brought them to Christ. Sometimes Jesus just reaches in, the Spirit reaches in and regenerates a heart in order that we might believe. But look at verse 6. But rise and enter the city, and you will be told what to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. Paul would say later he saw Jesus himself. Saul rose from the ground, and although his eyes were opened, he saw nothing. So they led him by hand and brought him into Damascus. And for three days he was without sight and neither ate nor drank. Now, not only does a new start require a personal encounter with Jesus, and I'm talking to believers as well, continuing to encounter the living Christ through his word, through the spirit, but a new start also requires humility and submission. This is what happens. Enemy number one, big bad Saul is humiliated and brought to his knees, to his back. He's flat on his back, finally looking up, and he's confronted with pure love. There's only two responses when you're confronted with pure love. One is to run, to rebel, to fight. The other is to submit. And friends, if you are not submitting your life to Christ in these days, I ask you to do so. I plead with you to do so. It's the only way to life. It is the only way. Look at what happens in verse 10. Now there was a disciple. Now look, this seems like a 
This is, this is crazy. Now Ananias becomes an example for us. Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. So a believer in Jesus. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias. He said, here I am. Lord, I like that. That should be your prayer. All right. Every day, Lord, here I am. You speak, I'm hearing you even now through this sermon. Lord, here I am. Find me. Find me. Here I am. Here I am. And the Lord said to him, rise and go to a street called Straight and at the house of a man named Judas. Look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. For behold, he is praying. <laughs> Isn't that cool? God knows. He's praying. I'm hearing him. He's praying. And, and, and you don't know this, but he's praying. And he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I've heard from many about this man. How much evil he's done to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. So evidently Saul got what he was looking for. He got the authority from the high priest, the chief priest, to do what he needed to do. But the Lord said to him, go for he is an instrument, a chosen instrument of mine, to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how much, wow, he must suffer for the sake of my name. So then verse 17. So Ananias departed and entered the house. And laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road by which you came, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Consider the courage of Ananias. And he's hearing from the Lord. But he's like, I don't know. This guy, I've heard all about him. And he's going to the most hostile man alive to tell him about Jesus. Now, I don't know who you have in your workplace, what your neighbor's like, you know. He doesn't cut his grass like you do. I don't, I don't know what you've got in your life, what family member may have something against you. I doubt that they might kill you if you come and share the gospel with them. And yet we find ourselves so fearful. And what I'm challenging you to do, listen, what if Ananias had not gone? I suppose God used somebody else, but no, no, no. What if you don't go? to the people that God has placed in your life. Where has he put you? Where is your mission field? Who do you know that needs to know the love of Jesus? Who are you seeking out? And look what happens in verse 18. Immediately, something like scales fell from his eyes, and he regained his sight. Then he rose and was baptized. Watch this. A new start requires obedience. What if your faith was determined simply by what you did, not by what you say you believe? Would anybody have enough evidence to prove you guilty of being a follower of Jesus? Do you speak his name? Is he king of your life? Do you declare him as Lord? Because look at what happens here. He, he immediately obeys. And this is, why, this is why baptism is such the great celebration around here. The greatest celebration. Because a person is saying, Christ is Lord of my life. And from this day on, I will proclaim him as so. I'll live as Jesus, Jesus as king in my life. And look what happens. Verse 19, taking food, he was strengthened. For some days he was with the disciples at Damascus. There's where he gets his training and teaching. Imagine the disciples unpacking. Here's what's happened to you, bro. Here's what's up with Jesus. Here's how he's fulfilled everything that you thought would happen through your own religion. He is the Messiah. And immediately he proclaimed Jesus in the sanctuary, I mean, in the, in the synagogues, Jewish sanctuaries, saying he is the son of God. Immediately. Friend, as we close our time today, listen, you need to know this. This is where this message goes. A new start demands obedience, but it also requires, watch this, proclamation. Requires proclamation. When we proclaim that he is Lord, that Christ is king, then we see like a like a flywheel. We, we gain momentum. We gain courage. I've seen this in my own life. When I share Christ with others, I see it happening in my life as he continues to move. We all have a story, friends. Every single one of us. If you're like me, I grew up in the church. I could say, well, you know, I got kind of this little Baptist testimony. I was, I was in the church nine months before I was born. You know, I, I was in the church and then I, I grew up and I was nine years old when I came to Christ. And, uh, you know, I don't have a big dramatic story. And then at 13, I, man, I was at a youth event. And I just re, you know, rededicated my life. I had a couple times. I, I was in college. Had these moments where God just revealed Himself. More. Nothing real, you know, dramatic, real. Listen, here's what here's what I've learned. 
even in our celebrity culture. It's like you, celebrity Christian culture. If you don't have some dramatic, dramatic story, then you can't write a book, right? You can't have a TV show or something. Listen, we've made our testimonies about us. It's about Christ and what he has done. The miracle is that God became a man in the person of Jesus. The miracle is that he lived the perfect life for you so you don't have to. That he died on a cross, he was buried, and he rose again. By faith, not by your works, but by faith you receive him. And he transformed your life. That is a walking miracle. If you know Christ, you are a walking miracle. And he's called us to proclaim this with boldness. And in the coming year, friend, listen. He has made you new. And he wants you to proclaim that to the world. And so as we wrap up this time, this first Sunday of this decade, let's commit our lives to him. It's the only reason to live. He's the only one to live for. I want you to think about how you're going to make decisions. You need to be baptized, perhaps. You need to join the church today. Immediately respond. Some of you need to say, where's the next mission trip? I'm in. I'm going. How about this? I'm going to walk across the street to my neighbor that I don't really know that well. I'm going to talk to the guy at work this week. I don't even like this guy. And I'm going to outlove him. I'm going to outgrace him. I'm going to bring him to Jesus this year. And if he rejects me, he's rejecting Christ himself because I've been so clear. Friends, he's called us to live with abandonment that we would lay our lives before him. I want you to bow your heads with me and close your eyes as we close this time. He's been faithful. All we need to do is respond. He's done everything that needs to be done. You know what you need to pray. Submit your life to him. Give him your life. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. She is a new creation. He is making all things new in your life. Confess your sin with one another. Repent and turn to him. Lord, do what you will. Blind us, lay us on our back. Do whatever you will that we would follow you and you alone and give you our lives. We wouldn't wait another moment. Jesus, we love you. We give you our lives. We declare you as king. And we go to proclaim you as Lord of our lives. It's in your name we pray. Everyone said, amen.